You're listening to The Pithy Chronicle. History with a bite. I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we bring you history's dirtiest deeds dripping with sarcasm. Are you hungry yet? Friends, Romans, countrymen, no, no, women, lend me your ear. Which one? I'll take both today. Okay. Please and thank you. But welcome back, pithy listeners. We have an exciting episode, another two-parter, this next two weeks. Mm -hmm. And we invite you to ask yourself, what is a dangerous woman? That couldn't have been better. (laughs) She wants to be on the podcast, Caroline. Well, she made an appearance last week and it was hilarious. What is a dangerous woman? And what is a woman who is dangerous? And what's the difference? This is a rhetorical question. We aren't going to talk about it this week, but I just want to pop it in your mind. Percolate. Does it make a difference how women fight for power? And without further ado, today we are talking about the little-known younger sister of Cleopatra. Yes, that Cleopatra. And I can assure you that this episode has sides, intrigue, drama, and a little bit of incest just for Caroline. Any story about the Ptolemaic period wouldn't be complete without incest. So let's get started with Our Lady of the Hour, Arsinoe the Fourth. And guess what? What? It's another Circa baby. Oh my gosh, I need my t-shirt. At least this one can be somewhat blamed on the fact that, you know, this takes place in BC, but still. In fact, do they even know who her mother was? Actually, no, which we'll get into. There's a lot of Circa happening. Yeah, lots of Circas. For the poor Ptolemaic folks dynasty so we do have around about 63 bc ish Mm -hmm. she's the youngest daughter of the macedonian king ptolemy the 12th alutes of egypt sister of cleopatra the seventh and kings ptolemy the 13th and 14th okay erica you haven't said anything about king of egypt or pharaoh isn't he the egyptian pharaoh he was the macedonian king of egypt whose quasi legitimate royal status compelled him to depend heavily upon rome for support for his throne in part because he had no money and was greatly in debt to rome exactly during his reign egypt became virtually a client kingdom of the roman republic and he was the first ptolemy to include theos or god in his his formal title. Oh, that's interesting. Dude, you're a client kingdom. You're in debt. It's a little much to claim godly. Yeah, when you're right. a client kingdom of Rome. Yeah, especially when Rome was a republic. That is very awkward. I didn't even think about the republic part. It's awkward. We also have the second part of his title, Alutes, which is not a formal title, but it does mean flute player. Ah! Which... Alutes... A fluties, you hear it. And it has long been a historical indicator that someone has homosexual tendencies. Now, whether that is true, we don't know, but... He had a lot of kids he did, to have been homosexual. Maybe he was bisexual. Let's not be binary. Okay, yes. We are all inclusive here at the Pithy Chronicle. I think it's interesting that they have the flute player in there. Was he just really... Adept? Maybe. Skilled? I don't know. A flute player would not be the moniker of a normal king. No. Especially a god. So I'm finding that it's a very interesting additive, and whether that's for some of his sexual preferences or whether he was just a really good flute player, who's to say? The only thing I can think of in my head right now is the jazz flute a la Anchorman. I see him now in his pharaoh garb playing the jazz flute as he jumps on tables and dazzles people with his skill. (laughs) Stay classy, San Diego. Despite the flute interest, let's go back. Quasi-legitimate. That is even more confusing. It is more confusing because it is more confusing. But here is the... (laughs) Here is the very, and I do mean very abbreviated version. Following the sudden and violent deaths of the last two fully legitimate members of the Ptolemaic family in Egypt... The people of Alexandria in 80 BC, quote, invited Ptolemy XII to assume the throne. And why him? 
what had he done right besides his magical flute playing. Do you see playing. where the issue comes in with the magical flute playing? There's something about it. I hear it. A little Papageno. He was the son of Ptolemy the Ninth, Soter the Second. His mother was the mistress of Soter and not a wife. So he was not the direct line. Well, he he's a natural But son. last resort. A, a natural, natural son. son. That sounds way better than bastard. It does. It's much cleaner. We should start using that. He was born out of wedlock and still ascended the throne. Go Ptolemy the Twelfth. Unfortunately, though, he was not well-liked. But he was invited. Why would you invite an asshole? I know. Invite the nice one, not stupid Stephen. Like, you don't want to go too nice, but... Listen, Stephen would not have fared well in mm -mm -mm -mm. Egypt. No, because they just like to murder each mm -hmm. other. Sleep with and murder. He was not well-liked, and shortly after his arrival in Egypt, Ptolemy married Cleopatra V, Tripifiana, the opulent, his sister. Is that a whole sister or a half sister? It didn't say. Of course it didn't. Why would they give us that information? Yeah. Because I know that there's a lot of... Brother, sister. Can I jump in with my incest facts? Go with your incest facts. You know how I feel about I'm it. I'm not going to stop you. Let your light shine. Thank you. The Ptolemy line. The Ptolemaic dynasty. There's a lot of them. They liked to marry brother and sister. A lot. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And even though the Romans thought this was really weird and, well, wait, incestual, <laughs> they still did it. You married your sister if mm -hmm. you came to power. Honestly, I really wanted to dig into his wife, the opulent. What is she doing? I'll take that. It's not a very flattering moniker for historical purposes, but for lifestyle, done. I mean... Caroline the Opulent, it feels right. Erica the Opulent, yeah, I'm fine with it. All right, Erica the Opulent, continue. In 76 BC, he was crowned in Alexandria according to the Egyptian rites. In Rome, however, anti-Senate politicians raised the issue of Ptolemy's legitimacy, which is fair. Okay. Producing a questionable will of Ptolemy the 11th slash Alexander the second, purporting to bequeath Egypt to the Roman people, which I find very, you know. You know, if I was a king, I would not give my entire kingdom pretty much no matter what, to the entire people that don't live yep. there. It doesn't ring true. This might be a good time to ask. Arsinoe, Cleopatra, and their line of forefathers, what nationality were they? Macedonian. Where is Macedonia? Is it in Egypt? No, no, it's Greek. They are not Egyptian. He did not speak the language of the Egyptians. Yeah. Was he in Egypt when he got called up to serve? No, because he was invited quote, unquote. It's just so weird. This is the second time this has come up in our podcast this season. And you know what? It never goes well when they invite a random person to come be the ruler. I feel like that's a little bit revisionist history, if I'm honest. Yeah, invited, proclaimed. It's, it's real, real hard. hard to distinguish. Facing serious opposition from the people of Alexandria and still unsure of his status in Rome, Ptolemy bribed Julius Caesar. Oh, I've heard of him. Yeah. One of the Roman consuls at this time with 6,000 talents in return for which Caesar passed a law acknowledging his kingship. So the entire basis of his legitimacy is a bribe. Yes. Couldn't be more legitimate. It's so political. The more things change, it's, it's the so more it's so right the same. to be so wrong. Rome nevertheless divested Egypt of Cyprus the next year, and when his brother in Egypt failed to support mm -hmm. him, the island king committed suicide. All right, well we have our first side of the day, mm -hmm. and we're only on page two. Was this brother also invited, quote unquote? Yep. To rule Cyprus. Yeah. And clearly failed. Cyprus comes back up. Yeah. I just think it's interesting that they were each invited and one got Cyprus and one got Egypt. And I'm not going to say that any one place is better than another, but like, yeah, come on. The loss of Cyprus and Ptolemy's submissive attitude to Rome pissed people off in Alexandria. And they drove Ptolemy out of Egypt and Reasonable. accepted his queen, Cleopatra V, and his eldest daughter, Berenice IV, as rulers. Okay. Dual ladies. To run a man out of town and replace him with two women is pretty amazing. I'm loving it. His wife, unfortunately, passed away some years later and Berenice took over as sole ruler as Ptolemy continued to try to gain his throne back by bribing people in Rome, but also fell into shock 
debt to money lenders. More debt. Ptolemy returned to Egypt with a Roman army at his back. Subsidized, got it. It's actually a pretty interesting story. Berenice really fought hard for her to stay in there and the Alexandrians backed her. They wanted her, Mm -hmm. not him. Not her father. But obviously with the might of Rome behind him, he was restored. He executed his daughter who had headed the opposition in Alexandria, and shortly Ouch. before his death... What side is that? Filicide. Filicide, The act of a parent sure. killing their child. Excellent. So, suicide, filicide, let's keep going. Shortly before his death in 51 BC, literally just four years after he killed his own kid, mm. he proclaimed his eldest surviving daughter, the celebrated Cleopatra VII, and his eldest son as co-regents. <sighs> okay. His extensive bribery had plunged Egypt in serious financial trouble, and the backdrop of him leaving them in debt really paints a picture of why certain choices were made by both Cleopatra and Arsinoe. I think that they were desperate. Yeah. And they have grown up with an attitude of, you deserve to be the ruler here. This is your country. Even though it's like not. Yeah, they also grew up not speaking the language, not liked by the people, fighting for a crown that no one in Egypt wanted them to have. Mm -hmm. And the only thing you've got supporting you are the people that you Mm -hmm. owe a lot of money to. So they just want you on the throne so that you can repay them the money. Yeah. That is a very tumultuous backdrop. Yes, and he is really fantastic. Sounds like a great guy. The political scene for what is about to take place, and that is basically two civil wars at the same time. One in Egypt and one in Rome. So confusing. Mm-hmm. Keeping up with it, if they had email, it would have been hard. But with snail mail, good lord. And it's not even proper snail mail. No, it's individual messenger going across continents. Ugh. Ptolemy the Thirteenth was not impressed with having to rule with Cleopatra. He was the younger. Yes, yeah, he was eleven, I think. I'm sorry. Are you telling me that this eleven-year-old didn't want to share? Mm-hmm. That's what I'm telling you. Sounds like a fourth grade problem to me. In fact, it is. Love it when fourth graders rule countries. It's such it a works great out idea. So well. The eleven-year-old, shockingly unimpressed with having to share the throne with his sister, who very much obviously overpowered him because she was who she was. And was six years older, yeah. which when you're 11, 17 is a big difference. It is. So Goldsmith, a uh, historian, cites that he, quote, probably was aware that his sister was closer to the Roman consul Caesar than he could ever be, unquote. Yeah, if she's sleeping with him, it's much yeah. harder if you're not. Mm-hmm. Pillow, Pillow talk, talk is, is real. real. Because he knew he was never going to have power, he incited an Alexandrian riot against Caesar. So in 48 BC, Julius Caesar landed in Egypt. So Ptolemy the Thirteenth and Cleopatra are ostensibly or outwardly still yes. ruling together mm-hmm. at this point. As of yet, she's not sleeping with Caesar that we, that we know, know of. of. Caesar managed to take the royal family hostage. Arsinoe, however, was very slippery and managed to escape with the help of her eunuch slash tutor slash mentor, Ganymedes. Arsinoe slips away, Mm -hmm. but he is able to take control of the two leaders, the rulers. Right. She then met up with Achilles, who was one of the murderers of Pompey the Great, just... Oh, Pompey the Great. She arranged successfully with Ganymedes to murder Achilles. Oh. Yeah. Why? A lot of sources mention a falling out, but no one can tell me what the falling out was. And it's left me to assume... Sounds like maybe like a lover's quarrel or something. Something that was hard, fast, and out of the way. Interesting that she was able to get away with that. She had Ganymedes do it. It wasn't like she went and did it. True. But she uh, took control of his army and assumed command, renewing the siege. And how old is this, what, 14-year-old? Mm-hmm. She's a circa, so she... I know. But, you know, that's crazy. Yeah. I'm gonna kill this established man who has already become a big player politically and militarily. And then just take his army at 14. As Mm -hmm. a woman. As a woman. Wow! So now she takes this army from Achilles to siege Alexandria. So originally they were going to siege Alexandria together. Mm Mm-hmm. 
But then she kills him for reasons unknown and then does it herself. Yeah, Arsinoe's army was in possession of the sources of the river, which gave her control of the canals that provided Alexandria with water and by extension, Caesar's water supply. So with this in mind, Ganymedes separated his portion of the river from Caesar's. He engineered machines to fill up Caesar's canals and cisterns with salt water. Now, we know that Ganymedes was the one who enacted this, but we think that Arsinoe was the one who came up with the plan. Really? Yeah. Again, at this young age. Yep. Awesome. Several days of increasingly brackish water panicked Caesar's legionnaires. I'd be worried. To the point where Caesar had to deal with the situation personally. Now, what personally means, I'm not entirely sure. Lead the army. Did he have to go out there and shovel muck? He's Caesar. He's not shoveling muck. He's Caesar. Aware that Alexandria was built on limestone and that limestone was porous, Caesar ordered wells built and restored the water supply and calmed his soldiers. Instead of battling her, he would just solve it a different way. I like that. When you're talking tactics and grand strategy, loss of life is... To be avoided. Yeah. Now, of course, there must be a siege. When it began, Caesar took his fleet into the Great Harbor and burned parts of the Alexandrian fleet, damaging the Great Library, which we talked about with Hypatia in the process. Ugh, such a shame. I know. Screw you, Caesar. Loss of life. Loss of library. Yeah, loss of library. Arsinoe ordered the Alexandrians to repair as many ships as possible, and they readied 27 warships for battle. Caesar, unwilling to give up his naval superiority, drew up his own fleet. That's 19 warships and 15 smaller vessels in two lines just north of the coast of Pharos Island, where the lighthouse was. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. We know that Ganymedes, then, by order of Arsinoe, sailed out from Eunostus Harbor and formed two lines opposite Caesar's fleet. So it seems like you just got four parallel lines and they're just going to shoot at each other. So many ships to shoot at one another. Yeah. And I just say, this is quite the tutor. Yeah. Ganymedes, he is going above and beyond the duty of teaching the girl languages and statescraft. He was a eunuch. So, <laughs> so therefore he has to be close to her? No. But he doesn't have children. He's not going to have children. He's very close to her. And even if it did become sexual, there's no harm in having some sort of sexual pleasure driven from him because there will be no children. That's true. And Although she's 14. She is 14, but... At that time, that means nothing. That means nothing. And so do I think that it was sexual? I don't. But I feel like it's more father-daughter to me. He is protecting her right to rule, and he is stepping in for the child that he loves. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think it's just interesting to know for people who may be like... It's funny. The sexual didn't occur to me. I guess maybe because there's so much sexuality surrounding Cleopatra... That's where my mind went. Like, Good point. They have to be lovers. Because she does use her sexuality a lot throughout her life. I just wanted to make clear that the relationship could have been sexual, but it would have been one-sided, resulting in no children. So it wasn't risky in the same way. So you have your four parallel lines out in the harbor. Two with the tutor, two with Caesar. Yep. Between the two fleets were the shoals, like a sand bank. You shouldn't cross the shoals. If you cross the shoals, you might get stuck, and then you're a sitting duck. Yeah, or when you sink. Both are bad. And a narrow channel being the only way through. So both sides eventually held their positions, neither wanting to make an initial move. So, of course, they're just, like, sitting Waiting. out there looking at each other. <laughs> Euphrenor, the commander of Caesar's Rhodian allies, convinced Caesar that he and his men should push through and hold for long enough to let the rest of the fleet pass through this small channel. So four Rhodian ships sailed through the channel and formed a line against the Alexandrian ships rapidly closing in, delaying them long enough for the rest of Caesar's fleet to pass through. So with the channel to his back, Caesar needed to win because he, like, retreat is not an option. Nowhere to go. And although the Alexandrians were excellent sailors, the Romans had the deciding advantage. Because of the proximity to the coast, the ships were forced into close combat, something the Romans excelled at. Two Alexandrian ships were captured, three more were sunk, and the rest fled back to Eunostos Harbor. 
After a hard-fought battle, but a loss, at Pharos, and the news of a Jewish relief army coming to aid Caesar, the Alexandrians decided to offer... A Jewish relief army? Dude, it was the most bizarro thing that I found. They are just getting the most interesting people to help in this battle. And it's like, why? Why? Why do you care? From what I understand, the Jewish relief's army was a mercenary army. Yeah. Alexandrians were kind of pissed with Arsinoe for losing, and well, yeah, they decided to make a trade. <gasps> Arsinoe for Ptolemy, her brother. Which one? The thirteenth. Because all the brothers are named Ptolemy. We thought the English monarchy had no imagination, but the Ptolemies. If you are a boy, if you possess a penis, you are named Ptolemy, which does start with a P. P's on P's on P's. So they tried to offer a trade. That is soul crushing for poor Arsinoe. That's rough. And Caesar accepts. Mm. He took the switch and in not at all, not at all a shady way, mm -hmm. Ptolemy was found rather dead in the Nile. Oops. He was floating, drowned. One would assume that he could swim. Yeah, and strangled. So Caesar killed him. Oh yeah, totally. He murdered the boy as like a, sure, let's switch. Here he is. There we go. That's mean. But it does solve a lot of Cleopatra's problems. It does. And there you go, regicide. Re half regicide. He was a half ruler. Co-regicide. He proceeds to take Arsinoe back to Rome to face the music. It was tradition to parade through the streets with captives and the riches won and then have this big lavish party and kill all the high profile captives and use the rest as slaves. This is, again, a very, very, very simplified version of what goes and on. And it's a very established and cruel mm -hmm. tradition. So what did he do? Feed her to a lion or something? No, while that was kind of traditional in some ways. She wasn't a Christian. I thought that was just for the Christians. I don't know if it's just for the Christians or not, but anyway. <laughs> but for our Senue, what did he have in mind? Remember who was installed as Pharaoh at the time. And who also happens to be pregnant with Caesar's child. That's right, big sister Cleopatra. Historians are split as to why he allowed Arsinoe to live. <gasps> so he didn't kill her. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Definitely not fed to the lions. Definitely not fed to the lions. And the Ptolemies like to kill each other. So they really it would do. not be that hard to see Cleopatra being like off with her head. Some speculate that it was sisterly mercy that intervened, but I don't think so. Oh. I don't think so at all. Uh, it's not really in character, no. It's not. It's not in character with Cleopatra, and it's not in character with her family. Some think was the fact that she was a female, and withholding execution showed that Caesar was unbothered by this little teenage girl. But I think the most telling argument is this. When Arsinoe was paraded through the Roman streets, there were jeers and all of what you would think, throwing stuff, blah, 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 but they were directed at Caesar and the Romans because they were parading this teenage regent through the streets. Oh, PR man. Yeah. Interesting. It's very Game of Thrones when mm -hmm. Cersei. It? Cersei walks through the streets. But Cersei deserved Cersei it. Cersei deserved it. Yeah. But what I'm saying is I think that is the effect on this young teenage girl who in essence has only ever just been fighting to survive. Agreed. I think that if he knew he killed her, she would be- A martyr. A martyr, so to speak, a martyr of the Egyptians and would make him look weak and incite more strength on the Egyptian resistance. He had just finished a civil war at home and didn't need anyone else to rise up against him. Bro was tired and about to be a dad. He wanted to chill out. So what happened? They sent her into exile slash the equivalent-ish of a nunnery. To a nunnery! She serves as a priestess in the temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Uh, but she's... Oh no, she's not really Egyptian in terms of her religion. She would have been Greek. Mm-hmm. True. Okay, yep. okay. And I can't find much about what that looked like, what her rank would have been, if any. Pretty much nothing survives. And we don't hear anything from her for five years. Well, if she was in one of those priestesses where they were secluded from the world, that makes sense. Because a lot of those traditional priestess roles were very secretive mm -hmm. and very segregated, just unto themselves. She was off the grid. 
Literally. He took her off the chessboard. Yeah. Off the grid. Yeah, and she seemed pretty content to be like, okay, I lost. I'm done. It makes sense with her desperation. Everything that she seems to have done has been out of desperation. It's not like she was originally trying to take the throne. She just didn't want to be captured by Caesar. Fair. Yeah. He doesn't have a great reputation. No. It makes sense that she's like, all right, he let me live. Here I am. I'm alive. I'll continue my life. In the meantime, Caesar meets a pretty disastrous end, as we know, and a power vacuum is created and very quickly is filled by Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, who is now the only surviving Ptolemy aside from Arsinoe. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah you see where we're going risky. here? I do. I see what's going to happen. Yeah. So whether it be sisterly revenge or that Arsinoe really posed a true threat to rule is up to you to decide. But Cleopatra convinced Mark Anthony to send assassins to Ephesus. Yeah. Dare I ask? Well. I think we all know the answer. In broad frickin' daylight, Ooh. Arsinoe is strangled at the temple. <gasps> No denying, no mm -hmm. pretend accident. No, strangled in the temple. I'm murdering her. Okay. Yep. And she died probably in her early 20s. Folks in Egypt and back home in Rome were pissed that this had happened. The temple was sacred and she had been there for protection as much as anything else. It's interesting that Caesar might have put her there for protection. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Caesar knew what Cleopatra would do and felt like... Maybe I need to have a backup. I don't know. I can't find any concrete evidence on that, but I think that's a wise move. I need to have a, a spare. It depends what you think about Caesar's love for Cleopatra. It depends how you... Right. And we'll her. talk a bit about that next week. I don't want to make next week all about the men in her life. It's about her fight for survival. And what was she fighting for? And I do think that even as in love as Caesar could have been with Cleopatra... I don't think Caesar stops being Caesar just because he's in love. No, he was always, always thinking ahead. Except for that one time when he walked into the Senate. Uh, yeah. That, everybody yeah, has, has an, an off, off day. day. He's just, They're not always deadly. Everyone was pissed. And again, it's not like she was plotting to take back the throne that we know of. There's no record of that. We never hear from Ganymedes again, so we assume he died in battle or in captivity. So she was just minding her own business. Oh my. Yeah. The assassination of Arsinoe was the first in a domino effect, in my opinion, that led to the political downfall of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, but we'll hear that story next week. And what a wicked web that will be. Oh yes. I did not realize that her death was so blatant. Mm -hmm. I find that very interesting when thinking about the downfall of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Yeah. But I personally just think Arsinoe was unlucky in life. I do too. She just, she escaped at the wrong moment because it probably would have been okay had she just stayed put. ended up in the yeah. castle. She might have been okay. And because there's so little about her, we can't, I mean, we can, but there's no real foundation for the speculation of what her motives could have been other than survival. The so little about her could have been because she ended up being put away into this far off temple in Ephesus mm -hmm. and she wasn't able to write. But it also could have been some whiteout on history. Oh, yeah. It could be that we don't have that aspect because it gives a whole new dimension to this already incredibly complicated war. Yeah. Group of wars. Well, and, and I found podcasts and YouTube videos and a lot of other sources, just not written sources, that did say Arsinoe actually chased Caesar from Alexandria into this naval battle and he was on the edge of being captured but leapt into the harbor from the lighthouse leaving all of his imperial regalia behind and Arsinoe flies it from the lighthouse in this like triumphal encounter saying that she has conquered Caesar and that is when he gets onto the ship in the harbor and that's when the naval war then begins planning and commencing. That is fascinating. But, but I can't find a written source. I can't tell if this is apocryphal, but all of the podcasts and even Drunk History, not that that's an excellent source, but, but like... such a fun one. 
And that, my friends, is that. We'll see you back next Hold week. Hold on. I want to do a sides count. How many sides did we end up getting in this episode? And then we can compare it to next week. Ooh. So we had a suicide. Filicide. A... Regicide-ish. Co-regicide. And then regicide for Arsinoe. Yes. Regenticide. But yeah, okay, fine. Regicide for Arsinoe. And then there's sister murder... What is that? Sororicide. That's a new one for us. Sororicide. I am so excited to add a new one to that list. Well, and Caesar, I mean, he died too. So that's another yeah, regicide. Yeah, yeah. Even though he wasn't We've got like, two regicides, a suicide, a sororicide, sororicide, and filicide. So five sides. Let's see what we get next week. Five sides, guys. Excellent. And that, my friends, is that. <laughs> I'm Erica. <laughs> and I'm Caroline. And we are pithily yours. <laughs>